Every day, bacteria, viruses, fungi and parasites can make us sick. When we are ill, we expect to be treated with the right medicines, including antimicrobials, and recover quickly. But what if no antimicrobials work and our infection gets worse? Today, antimicrobial resistance is threatening our health and our lives. When antimicrobials like antibiotics are misused or overused, resistant pathogens can develop, making infections more difficult to treat. These pathogens also spread from person to person or between people and animals and from the environment. Much like COVID-19, they will not only impact human and animal health, but also economies. The world stands to lose an estimated 3.8% of its annual GDP by 2050 as a result of antimicrobial resistance. The world must step up to accelerate the fight against antimicrobial resistance and prevent a crisis at our doorstep. Investing in containing antimicrobial resistance will result in returns far overweighting the costs, and more importantly, save lives. Let's work together to fight antimicrobial resistance and protect future generations. The clock is ticking. Good afternoon and maybe to some of you joining virtually online, good evening. Um, I'd like to start with a really warm welcome to this side event on an extremely important challenge for our Western Pacific region, that of antimicrobial resistance. My name is Martin Taylor. I'm the director of the Division of Health Systems and Services, and I've got the honor to be the moderator of this wonderful panel of experts and esteemed speakers today. The opening reminders, the opening videos that we've been watching remind us about the threat that antimicrobial resistance poses to our health, to our lives, and to our economies. It is one of the four priorities in the For the Future vision for the region. It's of such high level importance that the UN General Assembly will be holding a second high level meeting on this subject in 2024. That shows us the scale of the importance. Across our region, We've seen some strong political commitment with most member states now having national action plans in place to tackle antimicrobial resistance. The question in front of us though is what more needs to be done to stimulate or accelerate the implementation of these action plans and the actions that can slow the spread of antimicrobial resistance. So in today's side event, we've got a group of global and regional leaders to help us explore three key questions. How can we address the bottlenecks that exist to making progress? What can we learn from the recent pandemic in terms of how we can tackle antimicrobial resistance? And what actions we should we be urgently prioritizing? To help us start with today's side event, I'd like to invite Dr. Corinne Capuanu, the Director of the Division of Program Management to share some opening remarks. Dr. Krapwane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Honorable Dr. Van Heere, Dr. Siale, Mr. Joe Tseyong, distinguished country, country representative, partners, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this side event on AMR in, during your busy schedule at the session of the Regional Committee. The theme of this side event is a crisis at our doorstep act now on antimicrobial resistance to save lives. As Martin mentioned, health security and AMR is one of the thematic priorities for WHO's work with member states and partners in the Western Pacific region. There are three basic reasons why. First, antimicrobial resistance is threatening our health and our lives. It can affect anyone of any age in any country. It is conceivable that in 20 years, it could make common diseases such as pneumonia, urinary tract infections, and infections in newborns untreatable. This would turn many of today's end game plans into endless battles against infectious diseases such as malaria and tuberculosis. 
the impact of AMR is already real. Recent data show that it contributes to nearly 5 million deaths a year worldwide and disproportionately affects low and middle income countries. Second, AMR makes infection more costly to treat. It affects the productivity of patients and their caretakers through prolonged hospital stays and results in more expensive and intensive care. Professor Colling will update us shortly on the health and economic impact of AMR in the region. Third, AMR is not a one country or one area issue. Resistant pathogens spread across borders from person to person or between people and animals and from the environment. AMR severely affects human, animals, and environmental health, undermining the sustainability of food and agricultural production systems across the region. The 1.9 billion people of the Western Pacific who live in countries and areas with various levels of economic growth cannot afford to pay this price. We have made progress in these past few years. We have the framework for accelerating action to fight antimicrobial resistance in the Western Pacific, which was endorsed by the Regional Committee in 2019 to fight AMR. As of today, 21 countries in the region have endorsed national action plans. But we still have a lot of work to do. Pathogens change every, change every day. We are losing lives by not acting quickly enough. We must work together and redouble efforts to accelerate actions against AMR to prevent this crisis at our doorstep. This side event gives us an important opportunity to look at the latest situation, including challenges and opportunities in the region, and hear from countries on their experiences and ideas and actions going forward. We look forward to the exchange of information and insights from all of you so we can speed up progress and shape a future with a sustainable system through which AMR can be effectively contained. Thank you again and back to you, Martina. Thank you very much, Dr. Capuano. And your opening remarks highlight a couple of points to us. The potentially terrible situation of easily treatable diseases becoming untreatable. And secondly, the statistic that you provided about almost 5 million deaths per year. That equates to one every six per one person every six seconds. If we just think about how many people that would mean during the course of this side event. To help us understand the potential of impact of this all, both in terms of health but in terms of economics, I'd like to invite Professor Benjamin Cowlin next. Professor Cowlin is the co-director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Infectious Disease Epidemiology and Control at the School of Public Health of the University of Hong Kong. Professor Cowlin has been estimating the health and economic impact of antimicrobial resistance in the Western Pacific region. He joins us now virtually. Professor Cowlin, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. It's my, my pleasure to, to, to be with you today. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, do you have my slides to share on the screen? Thank you. So let's go for the next slide immediately. Uh, I just start by way of background by reviewing where antimicrobial resistance comes from. This study was published in The Lancet in 2016. And I, I could actually speak for a long time just about this figure, um, about the different potential drivers of resistance. The one thing that I would add beyond this figure is that I think antimicrobial use let alone misuse or overuse. Antimicrobial use, of course, contributes to resistance, but it's the misuse or overuse of antibiotics that we are particularly concerned about. Next slide, please. The project that, that my colleagues and I at the University of Hong Kong have been doing in collaboration with, with Wipro is to, to understand the potential disease burden now and into the, the next 10 or 11 years for situational awareness so that we can think about what's the impact of potential interventions and so that we can communicate the risk uh, to you and to, to the public as well. And so that we can talk about resource allocation. Next slide, please. Uh, we looked in our study at the potential disease burden in terms of mortality and also in economic cost in the region 
We looked at data that were available in the, 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 the literature for the last 10 years, and then we tried to project ahead for, for 10 years. And we focus on a, a subset of, of pathogens listed on the slide here. And that's related to the GLASS program that, that has a specific focus on, on the, the top priority pathogens. And our geographical scope was all countries and areas in the Western Pacific region. Next slide, please. Our analytic framework was to, to collect the data on infections and resistance on the left-hand side here, and also mortality, and then to put that into a model that uh, I don't have time today to describe in detail, but a, a, a model of the underlying processes resulting in um, mortality, also resulting in economic cost. At the bottom of this slide, we, we would like to include data on consumption of antibiotics over time, to, to have some kind of forecast of how AMR might trend in the future. Unfortunately, though, there is not a lot of available data on antimicrobial use. There was relatively more data on antimicrobial resistance. So we, we ended up having to make some assumptions for that part. Next slide, please. In terms of the available data on resistance, there were hundreds of studies that we included. The largest number were from China, uh, some studies from other parts of the world, but there was a lot of heterogeneity. And I think there's a long way to go to, to have more stable and consistent data from being reported across the region. Uh, and GLASS is going a long way to standardizing the collection of antimicrobial resistance data, but I think we have a way to go. So this just illustrates on this slide, some of the data that we included, there's a lot more uh, in the full report. Next slide, please. In terms of the, the impact at the top of this slide, we have the potential mortality over the next 11 years. So 2.2 million MRSA deaths would be 200,000 a year because that's for 11 years. And in terms of the GDP loss, the, the big ones as well are E. coli and MRSA uh, with substantial potential impact. Um, so th this is a, a major concern for us, of course. Next slide, please. In terms of the context with the other major causes of death that we're aware of, AMR is in the mix. You can see in the middle, our estimate 23.5 uh, deaths per 100,000. Uh, so it's, it's not the biggest, but it's certainly not at all a small number. Um, and and that, that's going to be an important estimate to, to share with, uh, with the countries and with the public as well. Thank you. Next slide. So this is my last slide. Uh, the summary is the first bullet point. We project a substantial impact from AMR on mortality and economic cost in the region over the next decade. And then the subsequent four bullet points on this slide are the policy implications. Firstly, uh, we think there's a need for significant attention comparable to many of our other priority diseases in the region. Uh, the next point, although GLASS has improved surveillance in the region, uh, we do think there's a way to go in terms of the the quality of surveillance data, the stability of surveillance data, the approaches that we use, and there's a lot of room for improvement and development. And secondly, for antimicrobial usage, I mentioned earlier, there's a, a lack of data on antimicrobial usage. And I think that's really an, an urgent priority to have that data. Uh, what amount of antimicrobials of different types are being used in different parts of the region? The penultimate point, uh, we know that investment in laboratory infrastructure is critical, but not only the laboratory infrastructure, but the data collection. And I, I would add that includes the epidemiological data that goes with the laboratory data. Often AMR is a, is a surveillance is a, an activity focused in laboratories. And my, my view is that, that the epidemiological data on patients and their conditions is also a vital part of AMR surveillance. It's not just a laboratory activity. Um, and then the final point, uh, I hope that, that this side event and, and uh, the, the council in general will continue to advocate for the, the need to raise awareness of AMR and the, the, the potential impact that it's having in our region. So I will end there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Cowlin, for joining us today and for sharing those recommendations at the end. You highlighted to us in particular the potentially vast impact of antimicrobial resistance over the next 10 years in our region, potentially 5 million excess deaths, and 
potential cost to the region of 150 billion. To put that in context, that equates to the combined national gross domestic product in 2021 of Cambodia, Lao PDR, Mongolia, and Papua New Guinea. That's not insignificant. Sometimes numbers like that can be very large and scary. So also maybe to go back to your opening point, we can take this back to the basics. Antimicrobial resistance is a natural process. It would happen anyway, but by addressing the misuse and overuse, we can significantly delay that process, save those lives and reduce that economic impact. To help us consider what we need to do and to prioritize, Next, we're going to invite Professor Dame Sally Davis, the United Kingdom Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance. Dame Sally is a well-known, world-renowned advocate. She has spoken on antimicrobial resistance to the World Health Assembly, to the G7 Group of Nations, and to the United Nations General Assembly. She's also a member of the World Health Organization's Global Leaders Group on Antimicrobial Resistance. Because of the time difference, Dame Sally, of course, can't be with us live today, but she pre-recorded a video. We're going to play some parts of that video now, and the full version will be available on the WHO website for you to, visit, to view later. So could we please play Dame Sally's video? It is a great honor to address the 73rd session of the WHO Regional Committee meeting for the Western Pacific. I'm delighted to be here, inspired by your leadership on AMR and you convening together for today's side event. Where the last two years have painfully demonstrated to the world what the impacts of an initially untreatable infection can be, the next two are going to be vital to leverage the lessons we have learned and build towards the 2024 high-level meeting on AMR. The sad truth is that AMR was increasing and not matched by political action even before the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated what is at stake. In 2019, the Interagency Coordination Group on AMR warned that there was no time to wait to act on AMR, demanding unprecedented action from governments, researchers, civil society and the private sector. Again, in 2020, the World Health Organization listed AMR as one of its top 10 threats facing humanity. And now, just this year, the WHO have issued a stark warning that the world is failing when it comes to access, innovation and stewardship of antibiotics. The report by IHME earlier this year showed that there were 254,000 deaths in Oceania directly attributable to AMR and over 1 million deaths where a death was associated with AMR. Globally, we haven't yet turned our policy and political commitments into action. I am impressed that 18 countries and territories in the Western Pacific region have developed multi-stakeholder national action plans on AMR. However, across the world, only 20% of countries are implementing and monitoring their plans, without which our global health security and the sustainability of our health systems remains at stake. As it stands, we do not know what the next pandemic will look like. It could be bacterial, drug resistant, or as flu dependent on antimicrobials to mitigate. At the same time, many of the interventions needed to prepare for, prevent and respond to future pandemics are similar to those needed to address AMR. We have an opportunity to now maximize the interventions and investments that countries are making to address current increasing future pandemics together. Indeed, AMR is a pandemic that's happening now. 1.3 million people died directly as a result of AMR in 2019. With this new data up our sleeves, we have a more comprehensive picture of the terrifying reality of AMR. But it is up to all of us to use these numbers to galvanize local, national and global action across health ministries and far beyond. With the regional breakdowns and mortality figures, we can show the need for regions and multilateral groupings to work together. For example, the Western Pacific region of WHO, right through to G7, 
G20 and G77. We need both collective ownership and action. As a matter of urgency, we need to integrate AMR into the global agenda for pandemic preparedness and prevention to ensure that our mutual priority, protecting more people with efficient resource allocation, is achieved. As we work together, therefore, we need to commit to real, measured action and resources for global health. And that includes for WASH, for equitable access to medical products and timely, accurate surveillance and alerting. We then need to commit to sustaining that investment so we don't end up 20 years from now in the situation we've faced since 2020. These are all necessary regardless of the source of the outbreak. I am pleased that the WHO Western Pacific region is addressing health security and AMR as one of its four priorities for the period 2020 to 2025. And in doing so, that you recognize AMR is a matter of security. Antibiotics are essential infrastructure for resilient and sustainable health systems, for UHC. So we need to safeguard, steward, and also innovate for new antibiotics to meet unmet clinical needs of today and tomorrow. As we look ahead to that high-level meeting on AMR in 2024, we've all got to play our parts in building security and sustainability for human health and food and water systems. And there are four ways which I look to you in the WHO Western Pacific region to support this through. First, we must ensure that all global governance mechanisms recommended by the IACG are up and running as soon as possible. The momentum built by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate has leveraged action through COP26 and the upcoming COP27. We need the establishment of the recommended independent panel on evidence for action against AMR to collate evidence for policymakers to act on. If we establish this before 2024, it'll enable us to use its findings to inform the outcomes of the meeting. Secondly, WHO regional members and organizations will have an important collaborative role to play with other UN organizations. I welcome the formal integration of UNEP into the quadripartite and encourage strengthened collaboration across the organizations and with international financial institutions so your technical expertise can be more than the sum of your parts. This will help us ensure the high-level meeting reflects the stakes we all have in AMR. Next, as we look forward to the next two years, we need to build on upcoming events in 2023 so we advance multiple agendas and ensure AMR benefits from existing work. An example is the upcoming high-level meeting on UHC, the ones on pandemic preparedness, prevention and response, or TB and WASH, where AMR should clearly be integrated. I look forward to working with countries from across Western Pacific region to make the most of these opportunities. Finally, the WHO Western Pacific region's five-year strategic plan commits to harnessing the power of communication to deliver better health. As part of you, this, I encourage you to bring in young people to become champions for action against AMR. Not that long ago, I had the privilege of meeting Eric Venant, the founder of Rollback Antimicrobial Resistance Initiative. Eric's a young pharmacist putting his expertise to practice, raising awareness of AMR across communities and schools in Tanzania. He runs craft workshops in schools and has even put posters on tuk-tuks and educated drivers to pass on messages about AMR to their passengers. There's an opportunity to think creatively on tailored modern messaging for the population of your region. Globally, we have a short window in which to build forward from COVID-19 with resilience, equity and security at the heart of our pandemic preparedness. AMR is an international, intergenerational, insidious pandemic, which we need to tackle at the same time. On behalf of the UK and the Global Leaders Group, I stand ready to work with you to contain and control the AMR. Thank you. We thank Dame Sally for her video recording and I encourage participants here to take some time to view the full video. It's packed with lots of ideas and potential actions. 
She highlighted in particular the need to integrate our work on antimicrobial resistance into our work on pandemic preparedness, and in particular as well, the importance of strengthening partnerships and interagency multi-sectoral working mechanisms. Now let's bring the discussion to this region and our panel here in the room. We have three fantastic speakers from member states who have joined us to share their leadership and experience. So if I can introduce them to you now, we have to my left over here, Dr. Maria Rosario S. Verhere, the officer in charge of the Department of Health from the Philippines. To my right, we have Dr. Siale Akaula, Chief Executive Officer from the Ministry of Health in Tonga. And on my far left, Mr. Joel Jiong, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of the People's Republic of China in the Philippines. Thank you all for joining today's side events. I'd like, if I may, to start with Dr. Verhere. The Philippines established its Interagency Committee on Antimicrobial Resistance in 2014. Could you enlighten us on how this Interagency Committee has been working, how it works to ensure effective implementation of the National Action Plan? Have there been any challenges? And how have you been addressing them? Thank you, Martin, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. In 2014, the President of the Philippines passed a policy which ordered the creation of the Interagency Committee on Antimicrobial Resistance, or the ICMR. I, this is a multi-sectoral body consisting of government agencies representing the human health, animal health, agriculture, trade, science, and technology, and the local government sectors. The ICAMR facilitated develop, the development of the Philippine National Action Plan to combat AMR 2015 to 2017. This was launched in May of 2015, which aims to provide a country roadmap towards containing, controlling, and preventing AMR in our country. It also facilitated the implementation review of the first action plan and oversaw the development of its second medium-term action plan spanning the period of 2019 to 2023. This was launched in 2018. The Department of Health of the Philippines served as the secretariat to the ICMR, specifically our pharmaceutical division. There are designated AMR coordinators in our regional offices to ensure cascading of programs and activities up to the regional and the local levels. Through the ICMR, the Philippines has engaged the increased participation of the environment and the education sectors and initiated the amendment of the policy to include these said sectors as official members of this interagency committee. The presence of this policy signed by the president served as our key driver to ensure that resource requirements shall be provided by the ICMR member agencies to support the effective implementation of the Philippine AMR Action Plan. The country has an antimicrobial resistance surveillance program under our Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, which monitors the resistance rates of organisms in human health. The animal health sector also has ongoing efforts to strengthen their surveillance capacity in animals. The Ministry of Health also developed training modules on antimicrobial stewardship to optimize the use and the prescription of antimicrobials in our healthcare facilities. The COVID-19 pandemic catalyzed the implementation of programs to take advantage of various platforms in the digital age. Recognizing the interplay between COVID-19 and AMR, we have doubled our efforts to promote and cascade antimicrobial stewardship training through the development of online courses for our hospitals and primary care facilities with the support, of course, by WHO. To date, the Philippines has already trained 100% of all of our Level 3 hospitals, 92% of our Level 2 hospitals, and 52% of our Level 1 hospitals on antimicrobial stewardship. Overall, 67% of our licensed hospitals nationwide were already trained on AMS. Highlighting primary care at the forefront also, we have started with our primary care facilities, and to date, we have already trained 1% of our primary care facilities, and we aim to increase this number as we continue to cascade the AMR training for hospitals and primary care. The Philippines has also been actively participating in the global celebration of the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week 
since 2015. And during this pandemic, we took advantage of the social media platforms to expand the reach of our advocacy. And the country is currently preparing our activities for this week-long exercise this coming November. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, Dr. Vehere. And I note a number of really interesting points for our discussion. First of all, you highlighted the top level from the president's leadership on this. The second, the work with regional offices to make sure that you had coordinators working on antimicrobial resistance throughout the country. And then third, taking advantage of some of the digital platforms that were developed under COVID-19 to train staff in hospitals and primary healthcare centers, real action on the ground that can make a difference. So thank you very much for sharing that. Continuing on the theme of what opportunities COVID may have brought about and how we can capitalize on them for our work on antimicrobial resistance. I'd like to turn next to Dr. Siale Akola from Tonga. Many countries are strengthening their health emergency preparedness. Can you share, Dr. Siale, how Tonga has used the process of strengthening health emergency preparedness as an opportunity to take actions to address antimicrobial resistance and your future plans in this regard, and in particular in terms of preparedness, but also health systems transformation? Dr. Siale, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, moderator, Martin Taylor, and thank you for the opportunity to include Tonga in this uh, important discussion. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted existing inequities and unmasked the fragility of health systems in Tonga. Therefore, leveraging lessons identified during the pandemic is needed to attain an integrated, resilient health system. For example, in addition, with other partners using One Health approach, the Ministry of Health was able to, one, to improve the laboratory infrastructure to facilitate the introduction of molecular testing <clears throat> and container laboratories for COVID-19 and other public health diseases surveillance. In addition, improving the laboratory capacity will contribute to the overall strengthening of the detection, reporting, and analysis of AMR as part of the pandemic preparedness and response in Tonga. Two, to coordinate training for most healthcare workers on infection prevention and control, rational use of medicines, including my antimicrobials, and management of adverse events critical to both COVID-19 response and AMR interventions. Three, organize the review of the medicine regulation to ensure the safety and quality of medicines and vaccines, including antimicrobials. Lastly, the Ministry of Health, Tonga, will work with other partners to review progress of the Tonga National Multisectoral Plan on AMR, monitor and evaluate the implementation of priority AMR activities in line with current epidemiology and context. Furthermore, continue the effort made during the pandemic to ensure system strengthening across all sectors, including protecting the vulnerable population in Tonga. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Siale. And I can see some common themes emerging already. The second of the points that you highlighted as with a speaker from the Philippines was training of healthcare workers um, for the importance of antimicrobial resistance, but linking that with other areas of work, infection prevention control, and rational use of medicines and antibiotics. You also noted the importance of laboratory strengthening the infrastructure and how the investments made in the COVID-19 response can be of benefit in the longer term for antimicrobial resistance surveillance. And I think that takes us back also to one of Professor Cowlin's points in his slides, one of his recommendations around strengthening surveillance so we know more about what is going on and we know therefore how to target our actions. Let's turn next to our third speaker from the region, Mr. Joel Jiyong, 
very delighted to have you with us today. As we know, China plays a vital role in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. China was the second largest consumer of antibiotics in 2010 around the world. And in the past few years, China has increased its actions to contain the use of antimicrobial resistance, both in the human and animal sectors. Mr. Zhang, could you elaborate what actions China has been taken to decrease antimicrobial reduce and what your plans are to sustain the effort and accelerate progress? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Taylor, for the question. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join the AMR site event today on behalf of China. Antimicrobial resistance is a common public health problem worldwide. China has a large population in a vast territory with a diverse natural environment and many types of climates. The disease spectrum, the consumption of antimicrobials, and the antimicrobial resistance patterns vary greatly from one place to another. This is further complicated by the disparities in economic and healthcare development among different areas, making it more difficult to contain antimicrobial resistance in China. The Chinese government has always attached great importance to the containment of antimicrobial resistance by putting in place a multi-sectoral collaborative mechanism involving human health, animal health, ecology and environment, science and technology at the national level. China was one of the first countries in the world to issue and implement a national action plan to curb antimicrobial resistance. China has been constantly exploring the ways to promote the rational use of antimicrobials and curb antimicrobial resistance. Over the years, China has improved laws and regulations on healthcare, drug management, biosafety, and environmental protection, established long term systems for antimicrobial management, implemented a series of standards and norms, improved the system for testing antimicrobial use and resistance and carried out international exchanges and cooperations. Through the joint efforts of the government, industry, and the public, China has made significant achievements in containing antimicrobial resistance with improvement in the rational use of antimicrobials. In general, the containment of antimicrobial resistance is good, and the research and development of new antimicrobials has also achieved possible positive results. As to the next steps, with the accelerated globalization, global warming and changes in human behavior, as well as the occurrence of emerging infectious diseases such as COVID-19, it is of increasing urgency for antimicrobial resistance containment to strengthen international cooperation and exchange strongly implement the One Health approach, form synergy and jointly promote development. As a major consumer of antimicrobials, China will release and implement the next national action plan of fighting against antimicrobial resistance, make prevention of infectious disease and rational use of antimicrobials a priority task, define the different responsibilities of governments industries, institutions, and individuals, and further improve the effectiveness of antimicrobial resistance containment work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhou, for those highlights from China's recent work and future plans. And I think there's a couple of points to pick up on one you mentioned the importance of the national action plans, multi-sectoral cooperation, and we look forward to the new national action plan that you have alerted us to. I think it's also particularly important to highlight as well, as you have just done, the importance of science and technology, the development of new antimicrobials. And we really look forward to China's really important global role in this regard 
and your leadership. We know that that can be extremely important as we prepare for the future. Um, now, uh, let's let's take, a, I think we've got time for another round of questions with our speakers um, to build on what we've heard, but now begin to think a little bit more precisely to the future. We've heard many different actions and suggestions for what member states, healthcare facilities, health workers and individuals can and should be doing in their role to tackle antimicrobial resistance. These are all important, but if we were to put the speakers on the spot and ask you what you think the top priority action would be, I think it would be interesting for us to hear from your experience where we should be focusing our efforts. So, Dr. Vehere, if you don't mind, if I can turn to you first on this one. From your perspective, what do you think is the top priority action that we should be doing together right now to make some progress in terms of reducing antimicrobial resistance in our region? Thank you, Martin. Uh, primarily uh, for the Philippines, uh, we think that strengthening and building capacity of every member state on surveillance on antimicrobial resistance for timely detection of emergence of resistant pathogens and for generation of evidence on the local burden that will drive urgent and concerted actions at the country level should be prioritized. The lack of country-specific data on the burden of drug-resistant infections possibly influences and delays the implementation of AMR policies and priority activities due to the lack of understanding and grasp of the gravity of the problem. Thus, strengthening the surveillance infrastructure and public health systems should be one of the top priorities of the Western Pacific Regional Office, with recognition as well that accomplishing this priority action requires the commitment and the support of top leaders to ensure allocation of sufficient human health, information, and of course, monetary resources. Simultaneously, building capacity of member states to monitor antimicrobial consumption at the national level should also be prioritized to determine critical information on prescribing or usage patterns which would allow benchmarking and enable evaluation of the impact of antimicrobial stewardship interventions. In the long term, correlating the resistance and antimicrobial consumption patterns shall provide significant information on association between resistance rates and prescribing practices and can guide the formulation of strategies and directions to pursue in controlling the prevalence of certain resistant pathogens. In the Philippines, these are also top priorities as we plan efforts to pilot case-based surveillance of AMR while continuing to strengthen the laboratory-based surveillance to better monitor our targets of reducing the prevalence of resistance rates of certain pathogens, such as reducing by 10% multi-drug resistant pseudomonas species infections acquired during hospitalization and obtaining a 10% reduction in the use of antibiotics in humans and animals. Establishing a national antimicrobial consumption surveillance is also in the pipeline, and we are starting by incorporating this in the antimicrobial stewardship training. Public-private collaboration and global governance in research and development, similar to what happened in COVID-19, should be another focus to ensure timely development of new antimicrobials and tools for fast detection to contain resistant pathogens and at source and to prevent further transmission. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. I think that was uh, extremely rich and insightful. And the last point that you made there picked up, of course, on what we had just heard from our representative from the People's Republic of China. But, uh, I think also it's really important to dwell for a second on the, I think the, the key parts of what you shared, Dr. Vekere, around essentially the strategic intelligence and knowledge, the strengthening of surveillance to better and more quickly and timely detect resistant pathogens, to be able to link that with antimicrobial um, prescribing practices and give us that information, that practical information, which can dictate policy and actions in member states and the need therefore to also have the antimicrobial consumption monitoring and surveillance 
increased and improved. And I think they're all extremely important areas and areas actually, incidentally, that um, from our office, we're very um, happy to work with member states on as we can take that forward across the region. Next, if I may, Dr. Siale, the same question from your perspective. What are the top priority actions that we should all be doing and be doing right now to make a change on antimicrobial resistance in our region? Thank you. I have a simple answer here. It was really to, to maintain all sectors' commitment and uh, strengthen political will to fight AMR, to sustain funding and resources for AMR, and uh, of course, systematically monitor and evaluate progress of each national action plan to probably implement and revise as needed for all countries and areas. That's all. Thank you. Short, sweet, succinct. <laughs> to the point. Maintain the political will. Ensure that we still have sustainable funding, and then all the systematic actions that need to be taken forward. Very, very clear. Mr. Joel, may I turn to you on this question? From your perspective, what would be the top priority actions that we should all be doing together right now to change? the course of antimicrobial resistance in our region. Yes, thank you. We suggest that global collaboration be enhanced by making full use of the ex existing global and regional cooperative mechanisms, improving the cooperative mechanisms among human health, animal health, and environmental protection, strengthening leadership and coordination at the international level, and promoting exchanges and cooperation in all areas of antimicrobial resistance work. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think on those last couple of points that you shared, the strengthening of leadership is a critical one. I know that um, uh, Dame Sally and a number of our speakers spoke about that and the importance of that in the international context, both in terms of what we do within our region, for which reason we're holding this side event, but also as our region thinks about how we contribute to and engage in that high level event at the United Nations next year. Um, can I turn quickly on to our virtual um, participant today? Um, Professor Cowlin, I'm not sure if you're still there at the moment. I can't see on the screen. Can our IT help us to understand if Professor Cowlin is here? with us still and would like to share a couple of reflections okay i understand i think he may have gone in which case um let's move on i'd like to um and drawing this to a close thank our speakers today your insights from the member states and the diverse set of member states that are represented here has been fantastic. I'd like to thank Professor Cowlin and Dame Sally for their comments. From this discussion, what I'm concluding is that there is still a high level of will and concern to tackle antimicrobial resistance across our region, that we're seeing that urgency, and we're seeing a wide range of extremely important and focused actions to tackle antimicrobial resistance from the surveillance, from the knowledge, from the will, from the systems, from the financing, down to the practical actions that are so needed to make a difference in healthcare facilities and with health workers across the region. So I think today has given me encouragement that we are on the right path. We all know we have more to do, but we are on the right path and we have a lot of the right actions already in motion. Our task is to continue to take those forwards. To close out today's session, I'd like to come back to where we started and hand the microphone back to Dr. Corinne Capuanu to close the meeting and give us your reflections from this discussion. Dr. Capuanu. Thank you very much, Martin, for your competence and efficient facilitation of this side event on such an important topic. I would like to add my voice and thank all the speakers in this side event for sharing your insightful ideas, experiences, and action going forward. 
it is very encouraging to see efforts in countries which resulted in a decrease in usage of antimicrobials or policy and behavior change. We need to collect all these very valuable experiences and information from the countries and we need to share them so that other countries can really benefit from this experience and don't have to start from scratch. It is also great to hear many innovative ideas from speakers about seeking sustainable financing and resources to support AMR activities. Equally important were your perspectives on using new technologies in health and agriculture sectors and cultivating champions among the younger generations to pass on modern messaging about AMR to the broader population. Many of these ideas may help address challenges and bottlenecks so we can see things moving much quicker in the right direction. As Dame Sally said, we have a short window in which to build forward from COVID-19 with resilience, equity, and security. We need to grasp this short window to ensure that AMR is incorporated into the system transformation to better prepare for future pandemics. As WHO, we are committed to continue working with you, our member states, with quadripartite partners, financial sectors, experts and champions around the world and the region using the One Health approach to continue transforming and shaping a sustainable system to contain AMR in the region. We all have a role to play. Let's win this fight together. With this, I want to thank you all again for joining this side event and all participants, all speakers. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. And thank you again, Martin, for facilitating this side event. Thank you very much. Thanks.